So I would now like to introduce our fourth and last speaker. Miss Chris Christensen is a six-time survivor of primary peritoneal cancer, first diagnosed in 2010. Her main treatments have included two major operations, four lines of chemotherapy and participation in the aerial 2 PARP inhibitor drug trial. Ms Christensen is the Chair of Cancer Voices South Australia and she speaks regularly to medical students and health professionals about her experiences of, of cancer. She's also a consumer representative on several committees including the Chemotherapy Standards Reference Group and the South Australian Clinical Trial Network. Please help me welcome Ms Christensen. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the invitation to be able to talk about my experience of living with cancer. I am going to talk about this, but first I want to share a quote from A.A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh. I do love children's books. It says, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. I believe this applies to everyone diagnosed with ovarian cancer in this room and want you to know that I think you are all amazing. So, to my experience of living with cancer. I currently have eight years of lived experience of cancer and being a lover of life, I want more. The last eight years have been an ongoing process of navigating and getting to know the islands that form cancer services in South Australia and beyond. The services I need to have the best quality of life possible. This is my pictorial representation of my experience. In 2010, I was living on the mainland, so here, and uh, I had a good life, lovely family, friends, work I really enjoyed, things I liked to do. Initially, I went to see my GP because I had a vague pain in the lower abdomen pain on having intercourse and some incontinence on exercising. He sent me to a gynaecologist who sent me for an incontinence test and told me to use cooking oil for lubrication. I returned to my GP some six months later, having had a lovely overseas trip in the meantime, saying the pains were back again. He said all seemed to be okay and to come back if they persisted. I returned a couple of weeks later and he ordered an ultrasound and blood test. Given the results, this was quickly followed by a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis. It was the 3rd of August 2010 when a locum for my usual GP said, I'm sorry to have to tell you that you have cancer. It was stage three, grade three, primary peritoneal cancer with epithelial serous ovarian cancer. Ovarian epithelial cancer, fallopian tube cancer and primary peritoneal cancer are diseases in which malignant cancer cells form in the same type of tissue covering the ovary or lining of the fallopian tube or the peritoneum and are treated in the same way. Recent research now suggests that many epithelial ovarian cancers actually start in the fallopian tubes and that between seven and five out of 100 women who have advanced ovarian cancer will actually have primary peritoneal cancer. The impact of the diagnosis on my life and the life of my family, friends and colleagues began. I was 54. The hardest part was telling those I love. My husband, my children, my family and friends. Some very difficult phone calls and little to tell them about the type of cancer treatment and outcomes that could be expected. Very hard too when your family live in another state. Hardest of all to tell your children and your 82 year old mother. The next hardest part was trying to find out information about my cancer and coming to terms with the diagnosis. It was a very surreal time. There is a big gap between hearing the diagnosis understanding what it means and coming to terms with it. It's like I had become other in a new world where I didn't have the language, didn't understand the behaviours, <coughs> didn't know how to navigate the new system I found myself in. I have learnt much, but can still feel like this even after all this time. 
I seem to become defined by my diagnosis rather than being seen as a whole person, and this did not sit well with me. I've always found that knowledge is power, and to cope with the social and psychological aspects of my cancer, I began to find out as much as I could about my cancer, and I continue to do so. Setting sail among the islands has seen me navigating a broad range of health and cancer services. So from the GP, oops, wrong way. From the GP down to the gynaecologist, to pathology, to the, where's the gynaecologist, hospital <coughs> surgery, um, radiology, chemotherapy, um, medical oncology, pharmacy, all of those things in the first instance. I couldn't have prepared for what I was about to experience, but did begin a diary which was useful in trying to work through my feelings and thoughts. Treatment began with a six hour operation which included a full hysterectomy, radical debulking of the peritoneum, and omentectomy, removal of the omentum, which is a thin fold of abdominal tissue that encases the stomach large intestine and other abdominal organs. I spent five days in intensive care and two weeks in hospital. During this time, I was very distressed and my daughter, who is a clinical psychologist, was instrumental in connecting me with a great psychologist experience with cancer patients. This was to be incredibly important to coping with the distress associated with my illness and I still use many of the techniques she taught me. Coping during this time meant a lot of tears, not necessarily a sign of weakness, especially being told I would now need to begin intravenous and intraperitoneal chemotherapy, intraperitoneal chemotherapy to maximise the removal of the cancer. It also meant a lot of writing, reading, listening to music, learning more about my cancer and preparing my body as best I could with good nutrition, massage, exercise, meditation and support from a naturopath. I was managing pain, getting through minutes, hours, trying to find out what was happening, getting used to being treated as a patient rather than a person, being spoken about at times as if I wasn't there. Being included and having information would have reduced my anxiety and distress levels considerably. I had 18 sessions of chemotherapy over five months with the intraperitoneal chemo requiring hospital admissions of up to 24 hours each time. During this time, nurses' poor skills with insertion of needles, a lack of communication about process, and lack of access to information about intravenous options caused me considerable and unnecessary anxiety. Hair loss was also very distressing, and I believe greater support and sensitivity for patients at this time is needed especially first-time patients, although every recurrence of cancer raises new issues, particularly when you begin new drugs. I have learned that to be patient, be a patient, means you have to be patient, which is synonymous for enduring, capable of waiting, tolerant, uncomplaining, long-suffering and serene. I'm actually not very good at any of those things. <laughs> but have arrived most days at a level of acceptance for this new life status. I realised that for me, the loss of control over what was happening to me and lack of knowledge of my cancer were key to my distress. Six months after my operation and having completed chemo, I returned to work and continued to adjust to living with cancer. In 2012, 18 months after my first diagnosis, the cancer had returned. I felt somewhat more prepared this time and was able to make some decisions myself, like waiting a few months before beginning treatment, discussing the options available to me and asking to have a port inserted prior to starting chemo. I also used complementary medicines from the outset to support me through the weekly chemo treatment. I continued working during this treatment, going to work Monday to Thursday and to hospital on Friday. It was frustrating not to be able to have treatment some weeks due to my blood results, and I hotly debated the decision at times. Continuity of my specialists from the time of diagnosis 
has continued to be a major plus for my treatment. I have come to trust the information, advice and options provided by them in order for me to make decisions about my treatment. And they in turn have come to know me as a person, my approach to living with cancer, my thirst for knowledge and keen interest in research. Fortunately, I had a range of leave options that covered my absences from work for treatment so that my financial circumstances did not add to the social and emotional issues I have had to deal with. I also have had very supportive family, friends and workplace, although I would say that having cancer is definitely career limiting. During my second chemotherapy treatment, my oncologist suggested I be tested for the BRCA1 and 2 genes. To my knowledge, I had no history of cancer in my family, but with the possibility that the information may result in being eligible for clinical trials, I agreed to the testing. Results? I had the BRCA1 gene. I was fortunate to be counselled by the head of the genetic service at the time, who was brilliant in the way he spoke to me about the gene and what it meant. I'm all, I am most grateful to him for the considerable amount of time he spent with me. What could have added to my distress did not. Oops, I think I've just gone the same way. Um, I'll go with this one. Time was moving on, and my next recurrence came early in 2014. The cancer was growing again. I began to call it the cancer that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. This time, when discussing options, my oncologist told me about the Aerial 2 trial, testing a drug called Recaparib, a PARP inhibitor, there's that word again, um, that kills cancer cells with DNA repair defects. PARP inhibitors are a group of pharmacological inhibitors of the enzyme poly-ADP ribose polymerase which tells you everything and nothing. <laughs> the trouble was that ethics approval had not yet been granted by, and my doctors were not sure I should wait, given the cancer was now impacting on my bowel, such that I found myself in emergency on more than one occasion. I just knew I had to wait for the trial and not have third-line chemotherapy treatment. I was eligible for the trial because I had the BRCA1 gene. One decision builds on another. It took about eight weeks, which were not easy, but it was the right treatment for me. This trial drug supported my return to good health for two years, until early 2016, when it became clear it was doing more harm than good. <clears throat> the cancer was growing again. Further major surgery in September 2016 followed. Retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, secondary debulking, and omentectomy. It took some time to recover from this surgery, and I was well again, but only until March 2017, when my CA125 was again rising to over a thousand, even more than when I was first diagnosed. I had thought that there would be more time between recurrences. As each one had so far occurred in even-numbered years, I had planned three lovely trips for 2017. <laughs> and said that I would not be able to start any more treatment until October that year. And so it was, I began a third round of chemotherapy, October 2017, which ended in April 2018. This treatment did not produce the results I had hoped for, and by August this year, my cancer antigen levels were 1,023. I had been hoping for inclusion in an immunotherapy PARP inhibitor trial being undertaken in Sydney and went across um, to um, be considered for that. But I was deemed ineligible due to having previously had a PARP inhibitor. While I was eligible for two other trials, I decided against them and opted to have more chemotherapy, which I began in September, probably one of the worst months of my life. <laughs> it has not been easy and I've already experienced a dose reduction an ambulance trip to emergency, and yes, ramping, <laughs> blood transfusions, a growth factor injection, and a break in the cycle due to low platelets. But I am hopeful of positive results. The tumours are shrinking. The CT scan shows that. Um, especially as the cancer 
had metastasized into the lymph nodes in my lungs and my treatment options are diminishing. I've also met with palliative care specialists to understand how they can assist. I'll just go back to the, that one. So it's just a few of the pictures, you know, fun times in, in um, the infusion suite, you know, lovely ports, bruises from having um, blood tests and things. Um, this was having the intraperitoneal cancer, you know, the lovely CT scans. Um, yeah, surgery, thank God we're asleep for that. You know, the beautiful hairlessness, what they actually take out of you and you wonder, well, how come I haven't lost more weight? You know, <laughs> um, protocol for your treatment. I mean, just, you know, I, I just keep a track of all of that and learn new things about what, like, things like little black circle squares on it mean. Um, and um, this was just this year, um, some of the latest treatment I've had. So I think I deal with my illness in the same way as I deal with my life. I learn as much as I can about what I have to deal with and then use that knowledge to create purpose for myself, putting strategies in place to support my continued growth and development, physically, intellectually and emotionally. I have four volumes at home of my experience documented to date. This includes copies of all my radiology reports, pathology reports, surgery treatment summaries, chemotherapy protocols, clinical trial diary, current chemotherapy diary, specialist reports, appointment questions and notes. I do love a bit of data. <laughs> As you will understand, cancer is not something that you have and get over. It's like sailing on the ocean, where you have calm days, stormy days, days where you just push through, set the sail to the wind, work with a team, and deal with the highs and lows that are exacerbated by dealing with the impact and uncertainty, so uncertainty of a life-threatening chronic illness. For me, the ability to personally navigate my cancer treatment is critical to me, as is who I sail with. Knowledge is gained through experience and being able to access good information in order to be able to make vital decisions. As Bon Jovi says, it's my life, it's now or never. I'm not going to live forever, but I do want to live while I'm alive. Cancer does not define me. Living with cancer is just part of my life. I wish you all calm seas and tranquil waters, and I thank you for listening. Wow. Very emotional. I'm pregnant, believe me. <laughs> emotions. So thank you so much, Ms. Christensen, for, for sharing so, you know, your experience of living with cancer so openly and honestly. Um, I know you've inspired and touched the hearts of everyone in this room and we wish you all the very best with your current treatment. Thank you.